Church, y'all ready to get in the Word? One more time, y'all ready to get in the Word? Let's pray it up, man. Let's pray it up. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I've been speaking it all day because you put it on my spirit, man. Father, your word says that the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. So, Father, I declare that in every single one of us, Father, that you are bringing illumination in our spirit, man. That the word of God that is used for teaching, for rebuking, for correction, Father, and for training in righteousness will be stewardly proper today, Father God. Lord, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus that we receive with meekness the implanted word of God that has the power to save our souls. Father, illuminate our eyes. Give us understanding of the scriptures, Father. And I thank you that every seed of the gospel that is sown on the hearts will produce a hundredfold more than it was ever planted. We love you. We honor you. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over every spirit, soul, and body right now in Jesus' name. There will be no distractions. There will be no demonic forces. Right now, we pull down every stronghold, every proud and lofty thing that is trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, any prejudice, any things that we are not up on, Father God. I declare and decree, Lord, that it is gone right now in Jesus' name. We need backing from the spirit realm, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Church, we've been having a ball this morning, man, so I hope y'all are ready to party. Amen. Have a good time. Oh, we've been going through our series, Anything is Possible. And Pastor Mike been tearing it up the last couple of weeks, man, so I get an opportunity uh, to follow and to build upon what he's already spoken. Amen. amen. Before we get into the teaching, man, I want to show y'all a picture real quick. Now, I heard some awls. I heard a few awls, huh? <laughs> now, I want to take y'all to a journey of my childhood, and I possibly will take you down a journey on yours as well. In this picture, it was taken four years ago, and if you're looking at the screen, to the right, that's my Aunt Gloria, and to the left is my mother Betty, right? right. Yeah. And these mighty women of God are sitting on the front row right here. Y'all give it up for my family. Alexis, Mike, Uncle Elton. So look, we're sitting on the front porch of Fred Douglas Parkments. Amen? See, I know y'all say, well, what about the A? See, in the hood, you don't put the A on there. It's just Parkments, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all know about the Parkments, right? See, we have Fred Douglas Parkments, and it's a part of the Phoenix City Housing Authority, right? But these, this front porch, right, these steps... They mean something to me and my family. This is where we grew up at. So you're looking at right now two generations of front porch sitters, amen? They taught me how to sit on the porch. But church, these are more than just steps to the entrance of a home. To all of us who have grown up possibly in the urban community or grown up in the inner city or even just grown up in the South in general, you know that that's more than just steps. See, the front porch to us was our sanctuary. The front porch was the cornerstone of the community. The front porch was a place of connection. The front porch was a place of community and a place of comfort, amen? See, I used to call the front porch the courtside seats in the hood. Because we could see everything from that front porch. We could see the kids playing on the playground. We can see, I can vividly see it right now. I can see families still sitting on their porch barbecuing, right? See, we stayed on the front street. So people would ride by, they would wave, park their car, then they come join you on the front porch, hey amen? Papa, we had a lady named Miss Jetty Parks. Miss Jetty would come and sell you some Avon on the front porch, hey amen? I mean, I know about that Avon. You can get insurance, food stamps, all in the comfort of your front porch. See, the front porch was the only place that you could smell the aroma of pig feet, candy, apples, and barbecue all in the same place. See, church, the front porch was a place of laughter like you were doing right now. But I really think back and reflect on the front porch, church. See, the front porch subconsciously was actually 
an escape from us from the complexities and the hardships of life. And it became our safe haven. So as we reflect back on those front porches, Mama LaJean, I know they were places of comfort in our lives and the cornerstone of our community. But as I reflect back and get wiser in life, I realize that the front porch can also be a place of stagnation. That these cherished spaces that provide so much comfort can be a place of us remaining stuck. See, I know, like myself and all of y'all, you can ride back through some of the communities you grew up in. And with love, we can understand that there are some people who are still stuck on some porches. These are people that we love, but they have been stuck in the familiar and the routine, and they are watching life go by. And Stephen, what was only just supposed to be a temporary encounter has turned into a permanent dwelling place. And I would be remiss if I don't understand that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us that out this arena and even watching online, there's some front porches that are in our lives. See, the front porch is places that are comfort in our lives that we have drifted to and don't even realize we did it. See, the front porch of our lives, it offers us security and it offers us comfort, but at the same time, it limits our growth and the furthering of our purpose. Amen. See, we're sitting on some front porches right now of past relationships that hinder our present ones. Some of us are sitting on front porches of bad habits and addictions. Some of us are sitting on some front porches, to be real with you, of comfort in our own sin. Some of us are sitting on the front porches of limited mindsets and beliefs that has hindered the further of the purposes in our lives. Amen. And what only was supposed to be a temporary experience has transferred to a permanent dwelling place because we continue to sit on that porch. Amen. But imagine, church, one day you get a visitor on their front porch. And their front porch has been your resting place, but that visitor comes to you and provides the power and the enablement for you to get off their front porch and to step into the newness of life. Amen. See, church, I want to turn our attention today to a passage in John chapter 5 that vividly illustrates this truth that there would be a man that was sitting on a porch for a long time and grace met him where he was at and gave him the power to go from the porch to his purpose. Amen? Y'all turn with me to John chapter 5. From the porch to the purpose. We're going to read the first six verses. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stopped, stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, church, do you want to be made well? Y'all yeah. want to walk through this passage with me? Yeah. See, church, we see at the beginning of this passage that King Jesus is entering Jerusalem. Now, when a king usually enters into a city and a place, a king loves to go to the grandest locations. A king will always go to a place of prestige. But Jesus Christ is a different king, Amen. and Jesus takes a different route. See, Jesus didn't go to a place of prestige. Jesus walked straight to the most place of plain, 
And that was Jerusalem's public hospital called the Pool of Bethesda. See, Jesus could have easily, as a king, went to the prestige places. But Jesus walked to the place of pain. See, I want to talk to us this morning first about this place called Bethesda. Now, we're going to see a picture real quick where people have illustrated on what Bethesda looked like. So there's a north and a south pool, and you got those five porches, and those five porches cover all the multitude of the sick people, right? And so the Bible is telling us that in Hebrew, Bethesda means house of grace, or it means house of mercy, or it means house of outpouring. So based on the name, it should be blessings flowing through Bethesda. It should be anointing flowing through Bethesda. It should be renewal and restoration flowing through Bethesda. But at this time in this scene that we're looking at in John chapter 5, the Bible tells us that this place is not a house of grace, but it's a house of disgrace. See, the multitudes of people are, are gathered around. They're on top of each other. The smell and the stench is up there, right? And the Bible says that they are sick, they are lame, they are paralyzed, right? And at this time, we see at this pool of Bethesda, it's not a place of grace, but a place of disgrace. It's not a place of mercy, but it's merciless. It's not a place of outpouring, but it's pouring out of sick people, right, who are sitting on porches and covered. Yeah. But church, that was the physical condition of those people. That's a great and a power illustration of us today in humanity. Because it shows us that the grace of God can cover us in any situation. Yeah. See, when we were in our sin and disgrace, grace covered us, amen? Yeah. See, when we had no mercy and were merciless, grace covered us, amen? Yeah. See, we didn't have any outpouring of godly fruit coming for our lives. Grace still covered us, church. Yes. See, it's the power of the grace of God that shows that all these people, even though they weren't healed, they were still covered. See, the grace of God in Hebrew is represented by two pictures, church. The first picture is a picture of a fence. And what this is, it shows protection and surrounding. The second picture is a seed. And the seed represents activity, and it represents life. So when you take these two pictures together, what the grace of God is, is God taking the activity of our lives and surrounded it with his protection and his provision so that the grace of God not only shields you, but the grace of God gives you the power and the desire to live the life full in the kingdom of God. Yeah. See, church, see, we get too comfortable with the grace of God. See, the grace of God is one of the greatest doctrines that there is in the word of God. See, we define it as unmerited favor, and it is that but it much more, church. Yeah. See, we wouldn't have never made it past Genesis chapter 2 if it wasn't for the grace of God. Yeah. See, the grace of God is God's riches at Christ's expenses. See, the Bible says that grace of God is God's love in action. The grace of God is God's abundance, and it's amazing supply in each and every one of our lives. See, I love the principle, right, of sowing and reaping, right? We all been familiar with that. That means that whatever you sow, you will reap. Amen. But you know one that's even greater? Being able to reap in a place that you never sowed in. Ah. See, and what that means, the grace of God is exactly that. See, Christ was the sower and we were the reaper. Amen. Christ sowed his blood so we can be bought and blessed. Christ sowed his pain so that we can have peace. Christ sowed his life so we can gain life, church. That's the grace of God. See, we have to always be conscious of the supply that God has placed upon our lives. See, the fact that you can sit right there and breathe lets us know that the grace of God is on your life. The fact that you can do this and wave and clap your hands, that's the grace of God. The clothes that's on your back, that's grace. The shoes that you have on your feet, that's grace. The home that you live in, that's grace. The fact that JT is preaching on this stage, it's all grace. In church, we have to be conscious always of the supply that God has given us through Jesus Christ. See, grace, grace, church, is the love of God in action. See, what God does for us when we were sinners, God covered us with his common grace, right? 
Because the Bible says that the sun shines on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that the rain comes on the evil and the unevil, right? So when we were yet sinners, God still covered us with his common grace. But the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit moves upon us, God saves us with what? His saving grace. See, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says that we were saved by grace, what? Through faith, not of ourselves, but it's a gift from God, church. See, the grace of God is a gift. See, not only does he bless us with his saving grace, but as we get in the kingdom, what he does is gives us the power and the desire to be able to do everything that pleases him. That's his enabling grace. And later on, when God going to glorify all this stuff, he's going to bless us with his surpassing grace, church. It's the grace of God. See, maturity in the kingdom as a believer is to understand. Y'all woke? Y'all still with me? Maturity in the kingdom is to understand that everything is grace. The Bible says in James 1.17 that every good gift and every perfect gift come from where? It comes from above, from the Father of lights to whom there is no shadow of variation or turning. What does that mean? Grace always flows from the top down. See, when we love up, that's worship. When we love out, that's affection. But when love stoops down, church, that's grace. And church, there was nobody as high as spiritual authority as Jesus at that time. And there was nobody as low as them people at the pool of Bethesda. See, the productivity in the kingdom for us would depend on how well we have the revelation of the grace of God. Amen? We talked about this place of Bethesda. Now let's talk about the people, right? The Bible says that these people were on these five porches. They were sick, blind, lame, paralyzed. See, I even give you another seed. They were on five porches. In Hebrew, the number for grace is five. We read in John chapter 5. John's name means God is gracious. So church, grace is just screaming out of this passage. And what we see is these people are sitting on these porches. And the Bible says the first group of them sitting on the porch was sick. See, what sick means is this. Sick means that a person is weak. A person is feeble. And a person doesn't have the power in and of themselves to heal themselves. See, church, I know that was those people's physical condition. But if we're going to keep it real, right, this is a whole picture of humanity because we long and we have a desire, all of us, for healing and for restoration. But the thing about it, church, in and of ourselves, we don't have the power to bring it in our lives. So you got the sick people who sit on the porch. They weak. They feeble. They can't save themselves. And then you also got the blind. See, these people, physical condition were blind. But for us, that can represent us being mentally and spiritually blind. Amen. Those of us who are in this house of grace, it shows us that these are people who lack insight and understanding. These are us who are not able to recognize truth at this moment, not being able to recognize direction and purpose. See, the Bible tells us that it's Satan that blinds our minds. So that means we have to emphasize being vigilant with allowing God to illuminate our eyes. See, I remember when Jesus, right, in John chapter 9, right after he healed the blind man from birth, and the Pharisees heard a conversation he was having, and they went to Jesus. They said, Jesus, are we blind too? He said, let me tell y'all, boy, something. He said, if you were blind, Miss B, he said, you will have no sin. He said, but because you say you can see, your sin remain. Amen. What was Jesus telling us? He was telling us that the worst type of blind person is the one that think they can see. And that's why Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, if the blind lead the blind, then everybody going to go into a ditch in the Mississippi River. <laughs> that's what he told them. So church, we have to understand that God wants to illuminate our minds. That's why Proverbs 21 and Proverbs 14, 12, the Bible tells us multiple times in Proverbs that every way to a man seems right where? In their own eyes. But the Bible says 
that at the end, death comes from that. Amen. So we see the sick people who can't save themselves. We see the blind who can't see. But we also see those who are lame. And in the Greek, that word means to halt, right? What it means is that these people who are on this porch, they have limited mobility and functionality in their lower limbs. So sometimes it was a disease that caused it, but most of the time it was an injury that caused it. And what that means in our lives, church, there are trauma and situations that have happened in our lives. And it has brought blunt force to us. And what it has done, it has crippled us in our walk. See, our walk in the Bible refers to our living. And so what has happened is there has been blunt force to our walk. And now we have a limp. See, our physical walk may be good, but our life walk is crippled. And the next people that he showed us on the porch, he said those who are paralyzed. See, that word paralyzed in the Greek means to be withered. It means to be dried. And what that means for us, church, is that those of us who have been dried up in our souls, life has dehydrated us. See, we're moving around physically, but we're not going anywhere. And so the Bible is telling us that all these people lay on this porch, but they were still covered. See, this is a powerful illustration to us. Even though we may be sick and weak and feeble and can't save ourselves, God's grace still going to cover you. Even though we may be blind and sitting on the porch, God's grace still will cover you. Even though we may be lame and crippled in life, God's grace still covers us. Even though we may be dried up in our souls, God's grace still covers us, church. So we see the place, a house of grace. We see the people being covered in the house of grace by grace. But now let's look at this pool, right? See, in verse number four, the Bible says that the people are laying around. And what happens is an angel supposed to stir up, right, at a certain time, the waters. And then the first person that gets in the water is healed. I know a lot of y'all Bibles don't even have this verse in there. And there's reasons for it. Now, I'm not going to get into the reasons on why, but a lot of people don't believe that it's true. A lot of people believe that it is true that the angel did that. But for the context of what we're teaching on today, it don't matter if it was true or not. What matters is they believe that it was true. They believe that it was true. And the Bible says that whoever steps in first, see church, my nickname Speedy, and I think about running the race when I think about first. So what was the Bible telling us? That these people's belief system was that the only way that they can get healed if they are first. See, their healing was depending upon their own efforts. And what this represents, church, this represents the law of Moses. This represents legalism. This represents religion. See, the Bible tells us multiple times, right, that the law of Moses was given to Moses by God through angels, right? So that's representative of that stirring of the water, right? But what the law of Moses and religion tells us is this. What can you do to get healed? But the grace of God tells us this. What God has already done for you to receive your healing. See, church, you got to think about the pool and the people. If the water was stirred up, Kiana, if I'm weak and feeble, if I can't save myself, I can't even get in the pool anyway. If I'm blind and the waters are stirred up, it may be stirred up over there. I'm going to go the opposite way because I can't see the waters anyway. If the water is stirred up and I'm lame and I'm crippled, that's going to hinder me from getting in there first. And if the waters are stirred up and I'm paralyzed and withered and dried up in my soul, I may have the foot capacity to get in that pool, but my soul capacity won't even allow me to get in. Amen. See, church, what the enemy has done in the body of Christ is this. He's tried to plant legalism. He's tried to plant religion into the body of Christ. 
to let us know that the only way that you and I can be healed is based on what we can do. The only way that you and I can be healed is based on getting into a pool first. And the reason why many people are still stuck on porches because we have that mindset that the only way that I can get healed is based on what I do. See, there's a difference between desperation and perspiration. See, desperation is, God, I need your grace. See, perspiration is, I'm trying to claw and I'm trying to earn and I'm trying to work to receive God's grace. See, one of them is a posture of just receiving. The other one is a posture of trying to achieve, church. Church, many people are still on porches because they're trying to achieve the grace of God. See, your strength and my strength alone would never get us off the porch. You already tried it, right? But what we need, church, is a power that supersedes our own personal efforts. Amen? So we talked about this house of grace. These people are covered by grace in the house of grace. Then we talk about the pool. Now let's talk about the problem. Let's go to verse 6 and 7. When Jesus saw him lying there, the man who was there for 38 years, right, and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Church, the Bible tells us that there is a man who has been at this pool that has an infirmity. For 38 years, 456 months, 13,879 days. See, when this man was on the porch, Logan, for 21 days, it was just temporary. But when you start to reach 13,000 days, it becomes a permanent dwelling place. And I can only imagine that this man's infirmity has started to become his identity. I can guarantee that this man was known for his infirmity. Matter of fact, he probably had a place on the porch that was set aside and everybody knew that was his spot. See, the 38 years is not insignificant, church. Rihanna, what 38 years represent, it represents Israel and their wandering in the desert. They're wandering in the wilderness. See, I know we think about 40 years. That was the totality of it. Right? But the 38 years came after they rejected the grace of God of them getting into the promised land. Amen. See, God presented to them grace by saying, hey, I have the promised land for you. But they rejected it, rejected the grace of God because they started to, Desmond, look at their own personal efforts about them getting into the promised land. And what happened was Israel started to wander in circles, right? For 38 years, God had the promised land for them, but they couldn't get there because they were still sitting on the front porch of Egypt. They were still sitting on the front porch of Egypt. Church, how long have we been sitting in our infirmity? Matter of fact, what porch are we sitting on? What porch are we sitting on? See, when that man was sitting on that porch and in desperate need of saving, Hezekiah, he got approached by grace. See, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. The Bible says that the law was given to Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, grace is a person. And you know what happened? Grace met that man while he was sitting on that porch for 13,000 days. And you know what the first thing that he asked him? That's going to be a puzzling question to all of us. He said, do you want to be made well? Yeah. Think about Jesus. The man been there for 456 months, 13,000 days. Of course he want to be well. 
But you know what, church? Something that I learned after reflecting in my own life and even being a spiritual leader over the last couple of years, if we being truthful, everybody don't want to be made well. Everybody don't want to be made well. You know why? Because if JT sits on the front porch and have comfort, then I have fear of the unknown. If I get off the porch, then I got to join everybody else in life. Or you may have the fear of responsibility. Church, after 38 years of being infirmed, if you get off the porch, you're going to have to get employed. <laughs> he may got to take care of his family. He may have to start leaning on God instead of leaning on other people. Yeah. Or there's the other option of us just getting comfortable and being secure and sitting on our own front porch. See, church, this man could not get himself off the porch. For 38 years, he sat comfortable. But there's another thing that he said when he, when he asked him, do you want to be made well? He said, I have no man. See, now he transferred the efforts of his healing from himself to somebody else. See, church, you can look at this either way. You can say that he was just being truthful. You can say he was making an excuse. Either way, he thought he could get in there. He couldn't. And then he had his responsibility of his healing on somebody else, and they couldn't get him in there. Amen. Let me tell you something, church. In life, it's going to be certain things that yourself and other people can't get you out of. And the only person that you can turn to is God. See, we teach connection. We teach community. We emphasize that, right? But only in certain cases, right, that only God can do things in your life, church. But also, I want you to understand this. He started pointing the finger, right? It was the dims and the days. They ain't helped me. They ain't do this, right? And I know that in our lives, many of us have been placed on the front porches because of things that people have done to us in our lives. And we want to be very sensitive to that, right? I'm sympathetic and empathetic with that, right? But regardless on who fault it was that we, how we got on the porch, Christ and grace is still the solution. So church, we see in this house of grace, the grace of God covering these people, even though they weren't healed. And we see what the pool represents. And we see what the problem was. Now let's talk about the power, amen? Yeah. amen. We read our last verse, verse 8 and 9. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Amen. Church, one of the most challenging things to build is a belief system. And one of the most diff difficult things to tear down once it's established is a belief system. See, church, it's not really if we believe, but it's all about what we believe. Amen. And for decades, decades, Bree, this man believed that the only way that he could be healed is through his own personal efforts. And grace comes to him, Miss Summer, with a different belief system. Call grace, a.k.a. the power to get you up off their porch. But there's a clash between belief systems. And I tell us this, and I shared this with the last service. I want you to hear this very carefully. You and I would never change our belief systems until our belief system cannot produce something that we need. People are not willing to change their belief system until what they believe cannot produce what they need. 
This man was sitting there 38 years with the same belief system. And let me tell you what the pool represented. The pool represented hope and despair all at the same time because he was believing that the pool would bring him healing, but he couldn't even get there. So the place that he had his hope in also became his place of despair. And what happened to this man was that grace, Jesus came to him and asked him, do you want to be made well? He offered him a different belief system. He said, look, man, you ain't even got to get in this pool. See, the healing pool that he was looking for was talking to him. The pool that where living waters flow from. See, the man was looking to get into a healing pool and the pool had came right to him. See, what Jesus was telling the man, look, Rise, take up your bed, get off this porch. What he was telling him, the same grace that covered you would not be the same grace that covers you off the porch. The same grace that covered you on the porch would not be the same grace that covers you off the porch. Church, yesterday's grace would not give us today's outcome. It would not. See, the Bible, all the way throughout the Bible, the principle is come as you are, right? That's the principle of it. And God is gracious in that but God is too gracious to leave you where you are see the children of Israel right one time in their lives in a season they lie God said go to Egypt it's a famine that's where you're gonna get protection that's where you are gonna get provision and then the grace was upon that and a season happened where God said get out of Egypt see when there was once a grace on a season God says now there's a new season and I got new grace. Just like we go from faith to faith, just like we go from glory to glory, God says you go from grace to grace. And it's not something that we have to earn, church. It's to be received. See, I broke the chair. See, look. See, this is what grace does. Let's stand up. Let's stand up in this house. This house of grace. Bethesda. See, this is what, this is what happens. Church, grace, pay attention for me. Grace makes Faith takes. See, the only entity that gives us access to grace is faith. So God gives us grace, and our faith takes hold of it. See, grace is made by what God has done on the cross through Jesus Christ. But our responsibility is faith in what God has done through Jesus Christ. See, grace gives us access, but faith gives us possession of what God has for us. Thank you.